Welcome to Kingdom Compliance with Dr. James Bruton, offering biblical guidelines, principles of the kingdom of heaven that will help you stay tuned in to the frequency of heaven and reap the benefits that accompany you as a citizen of the kingdom. The best the king has to offer. Today's topic is understanding the unity of the kingdom of heaven. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 13 says, Till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. I believe it is very difficult for born-again believers to walk in the unity of the faith without the knowledge of Jesus, God's Son, who was a perfect man, a completer, without understanding the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, the Messiah. It is also my belief that the division we are now experiencing in the body of Christ, the church, is due to our lack of understanding the power, authority, and supernatural manifestations of unity. First of all, the unity of the faith is directly related to the measure of the stature of the fullness of God. Metron is the Greek translation for measure, and it means a limited portion or degree. Helikia and helikos are two Greek words that describe stature. Together, they mean maturity in years of size, one of the same age, and as big as. Pleroma and pleuro are the Greek translations used in our text for fullness. Together, they mean completion. What is filled as a container, performance, a period, to level up, to furnish an office, finish a period of task, accomplish, complete, make perfect, full supply. In John chapter 3, John the Baptist testifies regarding Jesus' measure, stature, and the fullness of his grace and truth as the Christ. Let's take a look at verses 33 through 36, and we're going to listen to part of John the Baptist's testimony. He who has received his testimony has certified that God is true. For he whom God has set speaks the words of God, for God does not give the Spirit by measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Let's back up to John chapter 1, and let's entertain verses 15 through 17. John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness we have received, and grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Let's look again at the word measure. The Greek word metron means a limited portion or degree. However, the measure and stature of Jesus Christ is fullness, complete, perfect. Full supply. Notice that in John chapter 3, verses thir verse 34, God does not give the Spirit to Jesus by measure. Jesus came full of grace and truth. Jesus came fully completed and fully supplied. It is the body of Christ, born again believers, the church, the bride of Christ, who must come to the measure of Jesus Christ, the head of the body. Listen, if the head is fully complete and without measure, then the body must also be fully complete and without measure. The Spirit of God is eternal, which means the Holy Spirit is the complete form of God and His Son, Jesus. Colossians chapter 2, verse 10 says, And you are complete in Him, who is the head of all principality and power. If Jesus is the head of all principality and power, so are we, born-again believers. 1 Corinthians 6.17 says, But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Born-again believers are joined to the Lord Jesus, which makes us one spirit with him. However, if we don't understand that union, it is unlikely we will understand the unity of the kingdom of heaven. First of all, we must understand our union with the Godhead. Let's take a look at John chapter 17, verses 21 and 22. Our union with the Godhead. Jesus says and prays that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, 
that the world may believe that you sent me and the glory which you gave me, I have given them that they may be one just as we are one. We just talked about the union with the Godhead. This is our union with Christ. Second Corinthians 5, 17 reads, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now, let's read John 15, verses 1 through 7. We're still talking about our union with Christ. Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You're already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. Our union with Christ. God has union with all humankind. It's not just the born-again believer's union with the Godhead and the union with born-again believer's union with Christ. God has union with all humankind since he created us all in his image and likeness. And having sent his son Jesus into the world to die for all people one time forever, he now commands all men everywhere to repent. Let's take a look at that in scripture. Acts chapter 17, verses 29 through 31. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. And we know that to be Jesus. Now, if we understand our union with the Godhead, we will better understand the unity of the kingdom of God. We must understand our togetherness with Christ and our union with Christ manifested in oneness, as well as our union with the indwelling spirit of God. First, let's examine our union with Christ, our togetherness. We must understand that we were crucified with Christ. Romans chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed or cleared from sin. Just as we were crucified with Christ, we were also buried with Christ. Romans chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together, in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. In our union with Christ, we have been made alive and are sitting together with him in heavenly places. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 4 through 7. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. In union with Christ, we must suffer with him and be glorified together with him. Romans chapter 8, verses 16 and 17. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. In our union with Christ, we reign with him. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. This is a faithful saying. For if we died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure or suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny 
us. Listen, born again believers are Jesus' body, his representation on earth. The head and the body are what? Are one. What? Ever or wherever your head goes, your body goes. And wherever the body is, the head is there. By God's sovereign will, he has determined by the working of Holy Spirit to bring the body of Christ, the church, back into one unified body under one head, the Lord Jesus Christ. Currently, the church is divided. Therefore, it displays mostly weakness instead of manifesting its strength through unity. Through genuine love for each other, we must come to the place of expressing the oneness of mind, the unity of spirit, unity of our faith, and fellowship that our oneness with the Godhead affords us. This unity begins with genuine love, the same love from which John 3.16 speaks. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That is the love of God that is shed abroad in our heart from which we choose to show toward each other the same unconditional love God showed us while we were yet sinners. Love is God's greatest commandment to humankind, and it is the foundation not only of the kingdom of heaven, but also of the relationship of believers to each other. Jesus said in John chapter 15, verse 12, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Through genuine love, we express the oneness of mind with Christ. First Peter chapter three, verses eight and nine. Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another, love as brothers, be tenderhearted, be courteous, not returning evil for evil or reveling for reveling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. Oneness of mind with Christ leads to unity of the spirit. Psalm chapter 133, one of my favorite Psalms. My gosh, it teaches us the blessing of unity. Psalm 133 in its entirety. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head, running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down on the edge of his garments. It is like the dew of Hermon, descending upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forevermore. There is where the unity of the fellowship with God and the unity of the spirit reside. There the Lord commanded the blessing. Unity of spirit leads to, watch this, unity of the faith. <laughs> Let's take a look at Ephesians chapter 4. Verses four and six, unity of the spirit leads to unity of the faith. There is only one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. Finally, unity of the faith leads to, watch this, fellowship. Here's where the church needs to take a careful look at the practices of the early church. Unity was their signet. Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods, and divided them among all, as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Now that you have an understanding of your union with the Godhead, unification of the believer with Christ, and unity of the spirit, you should have a greater revelation of the unity of the kingdom of heaven. God and his word are one completely unified. There is no division in God's kingdom in heaven. Jesus himself said in the gospel of Matthew chapter 12, verse 25, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation and every city or house divided against itself will not stand. Every component of unification I've discussed on this podcast is foundational to the kingdom of heaven and operates in a perfect and complete way. God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit are not divided. Is Christ divided? The scriptures asks. No. As born-again believers, do we have the mind of Christ? Yes. 
This then is my exhortation to you, that we all endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. That's what the Word of God says. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 14 through 16, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Ah, I believe the most important treasure God intends to restore is the unity of the church. When we see restoration and unity in that context, what appeared hopeless or impossible can be transformed into a reality for us. Unity is one of the final purposes of God in restoration of the church. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you that we are in a time of restoration. Forgive us for our part in the disunity that has existed in your church up until now. Help us to love one another with sincere hearts so that the world will come to know, to love, and to glorify your son, Jesus. To your glory, Abba Father. Amen. If you would like to refer this episode to others, click on share and subscribe to the YouTube channel to stay up to date when new episodes drop. Thanks for joining me. I'm glad you did. I hope you join me next time for Kingdom Compliance with Dr. James Bruton, where we stay tuned in to the frequency of heaven.